I'm hoping my cat stay quiet during the presentation or you might confuse it for a weird frog sound. <laughs> well, watch, watch the cat doesn't get a frog in its throat. <laughs> yeah, but they sometimes they sound like they have a frog in their throat. Very expressive meows. They, they each have their own little personalities. So Monica, are you seeing just the screen that says Georgia Frogs? Or are you seeing anything else? Okay, and all the people, okay. Yep. All righty. Let's go up here. Aha, got it. I'm just now seeing that it's the junior session. I hope I'm not intruding. Not at all. <laughs> we are all kids at heart. There you go. I don't think I ever really grew up as far as like playing outside and enjoying creatures. And that's, I've been like that since day one. No reason to stop that at all. Nope. Or to stop learning ever. Welcome, Liz. Hello. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, what are you doing? Okay, y'all ready to start? Let's do it. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us. This is the second session for Adopt a Stream Junior. So I saw some of you last week for Ranger Jerry's pond study. We had a good time doing a virtual pond student study. Um, we wish we could all be together at Unicoi. Sorry that that's not possible this year, but hopefully we'll be back together in person next year. So my name is Monica. I work with the adopt stream folks in the state office, and my job is to coordinate water education programs for kindergarten through 12th grade teachers. And one of my favorite parts of my job is when I actually get to work with students like some of you. So thanks for being here. Um, also with us tonight, we have a special guest from the Department of Natural Resources, Wildlife Resources Division, and that's Ms. Linda May. Linda's an environmental educator. She's been doing it for over 25 years now, and she has taught people of all ages all about Georgia's amazing plants and animals. And currently, she's the coordinator for the Urban Wildlife Program. So in that role, she helps folks in the metro Atlanta area kind of become more familiar with the creatures that share all of our neighborhoods and, and really how to live peacefully with those animals. So I wanna go over just a couple of things about Zoom for any of you who may not have, be familiar with it or have not used it very much. Um, for those of you who are using your parents' account or your parents' computer, you can change the name so that we know your name. Um, and you do that by scrolling down at the bottom and there's a button that says participants. If you click on that and then up on the right hand side, you'll see the names. And if you just sort of hover over the, your parent's name, you'll see a button that says more, and then you can click rename, and then you can type your name in there. And some of you have already done that. 
Also at the bottom of your screen, there's a, a button that looks like a microphone and there's a button that looks like a camera. And feel free to leave your cameras on. We encourage you to leave them on. Um, parents just know that we are recording the session. Um, but we're gonna keep most everybody muted just so that we can all hear the presentation and there won't be a lot of background noise or disruption. We don't wanna discourage you from asking questions, however. So if you have a question, feel free to use the chat box. So there's a chat button at the bottom of your screen and that will pull up an area where you can type your question. And then we're also gonna do some questions at the end so we may be able to unmute you if you have questions then. Um, let's see. Also during the presentation, we're gonna have some fun questions pop up. So when those questions pop up, you're gonna use the mouse to select your answer. If those questions pop up and they're right in the way of what you need to see, you can grab your mouse and click on the question box and you can drag it over to the side and that way it won't obstruct your view. Okay. Anything else you can think of, Linda, as far as logistics? I think that's got it. Um, okay. Just, you know, hope, hopefully you guys just sit back and enjoy and have fun. And if you have any technical difficulties, if you'll just put those in the chat box and Monica can help you out. I won't actually be able to see the chat box during the presentation. Monica's kind of the person behind the scenes handling all the, the logistics here. So um, she'll let me know if, if there's something that we need to do or if you have a burning question we need to answer. That's right. So um, think of those questions. If you don't want to type them, just try and remember it for the end and, and we'll make sure we have some time to get to all those questions before we're finished. Okay. Sounds so good. let's get to the fun stuff. Um, tonight, Linda's gonna teach us about many of the different frog species that live in our state. Uh, we're gonna learn how many different species live here. We're gonna learn where they live. We're even gonna get to hear some of the sounds that they make. And then hopefully by the end of the session, we're gonna be able to identify different frogs that um, make noises in our area. Um, so she's also going to share some resources with us. So if you want to learn more, you'll have an opportunity um, to figure out and, and see where you can go to learn more about frogs. Perfect. So nothing else. Let's go ahead and get started. All righty. So welcome again to this Zoom session. And as Monica said, I wish we could be doing this in person. That's normally what I do is go out and do programs at schools and libraries and really um, any kind of audience that that wants me to to teach about wildlife. But so this is kind of a new adventure for me and um, I appreciate you guys coming along for it. And frogs are one of my favorite subjects. I've always enjoyed them. Um, just think they're fun little creatures. They have a lot of personality. And I think you guys will enjoy learning some neat facts about them today. So we're gonna get started. I'm gonna go over just some basic Georgia frog info. And let's see, make sure I can, there we go. And then we're gonna get into some fun sounds to learn how to identify them by sound, but also by sight. So Georgia is home to 32 different species of frogs. And there's a couple different groups. We have what we call true frogs, and they're the ones that are really aquatic. They live almost their whole lives in the water, and they have webbed feet like ducks. And then you have true toads, which are a little wartier in appearance. They have a little bit thicker skin, and so that means they can travel farther away from water without drying up. And, you know, otherwise they still need to be near water, but they can go just a little bit further away. And then we have tree frogs, which um, they're, they're more like tree frogs. You can see they don't have the true webbing feet, but they do have these little round discs on the tip of their toes and those kind of act like little suction cups and help them stick to tree branches and sometimes your window and years ago, I would always find them inside a plastic trash can on a deck at this nature center where I worked. They liked it in there for some reason. 
And then we have itty bitty little frogs. Lots of them are pretty small actually. Um, this cricket frog is really little. It's maybe the size of my thumbnail. And they often have these little triangles on their, on their heads. And then there's a couple weirdos that sort of have their own little group. They're the only members of their group. There's one called a narrow mouth toad, another itty bitty jobber, and then a spade foot toad that spends a lot of its life underground until it rains really heavy. So we're fortunate to have quite a variety here in Georgia, which, you know, variety makes life more fun. And especially when you come across something you've never seen or heard before, that's always fun. So looking at this map, um, let's see. Oh, we forgot to do a poll. Thank you, Monica. I'll go back to the, the last one. So um, what I mentioned, what I meant to mention was that all toes are just a type of frog. So let's see if you can answer this question then. Which of the following sentences is true? All toads are frogs, all frogs are toads. It's kind of tricky, huh? Yeah, it is. I, I'd say both. <laughs> <laughs> So keep in mind, all these pictures that you see on the screen are of frogs. That gives you a hint. And you know what, with these polls, don't worry if you get it right or wrong, we can't tell whose answers are whose and it's really just for fun. Kind of keep you engaged during the presentation. And I was so excited to keep going that I <laughs> forgot about the first one. So thank goodness Monica's behind the wheel back there. All right, well, those of you who, su who said all toads are frogs, you are correct. So a toad is just a type of frog, um, just like a rose is a type of flower. So are all flowers roses? No, but all roses are flowers. So same thing with frogs. All toads are frogs, but not all frogs are toads. Little Little mind bender there for you. All right, so we got that. That's a fascinating little trivia for <laughs> next time you go hang out with your neighbors. All right, so let's go ahead and close this poll. And all right, so let's look at the different um, varieties of frogs and where they live in Georgia. So this is a map of Georgia and it's divided up into all the different counties. And you may not know exactly which county you're in. It may be a little hard to tell. Um, they're not labeled, but maybe your parents can help if they're around. So if you kind of find what county you're in, you'll see it's a certain color. And then if you look and find this color over in this chart here, that'll tell you the number of different types of frog species that live in your area. And as you can tell, um, as the colors get darker, the further south in Georgia that you go, the darker, the, uh, the more frogs you have. So in other words, the further south you travel, like towards Florida, the more variety of frogs you would find. So see if you can find your county on the map and then get an idea of how many different species live near you. For example, I'm in Spalding County, which is this little one right here. So I have 16 to 18 different species in my county. So um, Monica, you want to put that poll up? And then you can choose which one of these applies to you. And like Monica said, if you're having trouble seeing the the color codes, because um, your poll box is in the way, you can just click on the top of the box and slide it over to the side to see better. Okay. So I'm guessing just by your answers so far that most of you, well, we'll see, yeah, most of you 
um, live in the northern part of the state, somewhere around Metro Atlanta here. And I do see someone that's in South Georgia, because you've got 22 to 24 different species. So that's pretty cool. And then we've got someone, two people actually, who were up in this area probably, or possibly down in these two counties here. But in any case, no matter where you live, you've got a nice variety, at least a couple dozen, if not more, of different frogs that live in your area. And, you know, that's probably more than you realize. I know it was for me when I first learned that. All right, so we're gonna close that poll and go on to the next slide. All right, so where do frogs live? Well, you probably already know that they need water um, during their lifetimes. They have to have water to, to um, stay moist. If they, if they get dried up, then they will die. Um, so there's all different kinds of places. I, I think most of the areas people think of when they think of frogs are around lakes or ponds, but certainly creeks could have them. Um, this was a house plant that was just out on my friend's patio and she had a couple tree frogs hanging out in there during the day. And then even just a, a puddle in the middle of a grassy area. If you've ever had a really heavy rain and the water starts puddling up in the grass, a lot of times you'll get frogs in there. So anywhere that there could be water, um, there could be frogs and it doesn't have to be a big body of water. Like I said, it could be a puddle, it could be um, a trash can lid that was left out during the rain and it pulls up, you could get frogs there. They're very resourceful. And we have one rare frog species that doesn't look like it would be living in this sandy soil here. Maybe the person who um, selected the 22 to 24 frog species in the last slide uh, might have these near you. But the gopher frog, that is a rare species, and they're called a gopher frog because they live in the burrows, this little hole right here, of the gopher tortoise. And just like not all frogs are toads, not all turtles are tortoises, but all tortoises are turtles. Ah, I'm doing all kinds of brain twisters on you, aren't I? But the gopher tortoise is also a rare species and it uses its shovel-like front feet to dig burrows in the ground and they can go up to 10 feet deep and 40 feet long. They have to have that sandy soil that's only in South Georgia to be able to dig those burrows. If you go further north towards Atlanta where the soil is really hard and clay-like or even further north in the mountains where there's rocks, they wouldn't be able to live there. So they can only live in the southern part of the state. And then the gopher frog, you know, it needs to stay moist. And so whatever rainfall there's been in that soil, it kind of creates a cool, moist environment within that gopher tortoise burrow for them to live. So that's a pretty cool little frog. Um, if you ever go in South Georgia and you see one of these holes and you're like, what in the world is that? It is a gopher tortoise burrow. And not only gopher frogs live under there, but there's over 300 other species that use those burrows for shelter and for regulating their body temperature. Um, or even if there's a lightning set fire that comes across, it gives them a place to go and not get burned. So really important creature down there. All right, so frogs, this might be kind of a big word for you guys, but they are what we call bioindicators. An indicator is like a sign of something and bio means life. So it's a sign that there's something going on in the environment. And so if you see a frog that looks weird like this, because they live, you know, frogs live both on land and in the water, they can pick up stuff. You know, they can kind of tell us what's going on in the environment, maybe a little bit better than some other creatures. They even breathe through their skin. So if there's any kind of pollution in the area, chemicals that shouldn't be there, then they are maybe going to be the first ones to pick up on that. So I have never personally seen a frog with crazy legs like this. Um, but if I did, then I would know, oh goodness, there's something going on in the woods here or the forest or the water. 
and we would need to do a little more research and to figure out what that is and hopefully fix it. So if you have healthy looking frogs, you've probably got a healthy environment. Um, the water should be clean if, if the frogs are doing well. Some frogs are a little more picky about where they live than other species. Um, for example, there's a, there's a one species called a coat spray tree frog that's not picky about where it lives at all. Um, and then there's others that, you know, they really want the clean water. So sometimes, depending on what species we see in an area, that will tell us about the health of the environment. All right, so other benefits of frogs, other reasons we should care about them. This picture may bother some of you. It's kind of sad. We're talking about how much we love frogs, and this one's getting eaten by a great blue heron. But they do serve as food for other animals. They are part of the food chain. Depending on what grade you're in, you maybe have learned about food chains. Um, but you know, frogs are gonna eat bugs and, and then something's gonna eat them and then maybe something else will eat that. And that's just all part of how nature works. So, um, you know, hopefully it's done quickly, uh, but they do have ways of hopping away and getting away from a lot of predators too. So they're not all doomed by great blue herons. All right. So I alluded to this a little bit when I mentioned about frogs eating bugs. Frogs help people too. If you've ever grown a garden and you've had insects eating your vegetables or your flowers that you love so much, it's really helpful to have a frog around that helps to um, eat some of those bugs up so that your plants can stay healthy. And I just thought this was a goofy little cartoon. I hope you guys enjoy it too. So why are frogs so happy? They eat whatever bugs them. And that's that, you know, can we eat whoever bugs us? Probably not. So you have to be a frog to be able to do that. All right, and then, you know, above, above and beyond all these cool um, facts about frogs, like I mentioned earlier at the get-go, just seeing and hearing them is fun. And that's good enough reason to wanna to learn more about them. So that's what we're gonna do now. Uh, we are gonna learn just a little more about them and. Uh, we will see and hear some particular species that live in our areas, in our state. So if you've ever learned about life cycles, which I'm sure some of you have, and if you haven't already, you probably will soon. This is a, a depiction of, of how a frog reproduces. So you've got the adult frog here, and they lay eggs. And then they hatch out tadpoles, or a long time ago, people used to call tadpoles polywogs, which is kind of a fun word. And during this time, they're like a fish pretty much. They're swimming in the water and they're breathing through gills like fish would. And they have a tail. And then slowly but surely, they go through this process um, to change from this creature here to this creature here. And, um, and they'll start to get their back legs in and their tail will um, kind of shrink. And then it just gets shorter and shorter. And at one point, when their tail's almost gone, they got all four of their legs, they'll be able to hop out of the water. So, and, there's a lot of things going on on the outside of their body then, but there's also things going on the inside of their body. So instead of breathing from gills like they did in the water, they get lungs just like you and I have. And there's even some things that change with their heart structure. So it's a big crazy process um, that, you know, to switch from a tadpole to an adult frog. And Monica, I believe I skipped accidentally one of the previous polls, but can you pull up the poll about what that goes with this slide? Thank you. All right, so what do you call the process of an animal growing up, changing from one type of creature to a completely different looking adult? And some of you have maybe heard this word before, and for some of you it might be new, and that's okay. And it's I'll give you a hint, it's a pretty big word. It's probably one of the biggest words I've heard. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
All right, looks like everybody's saying metamorphosis. You are correct, very good. So, um, and one thing I meant to mention on the last slide, so I'll just go back to it. This is a, a frog that's calling. It's got this big vocal pouch. It's gonna send air past its, its vocal cords to make a really loud sound. And so, why do frogs call? What's the point of that? Let's pull that poll up, Monica, if you don't mind. Thank you. Why do they make sounds? Is it to attract insects? Is it to scare away predators? Or is it to attract a mate? All right, you guys got a little heads up with the life cycle picture, didn't you? Um, you are all correct to attract a mate. So that's why they're doing this. That's the main reason. There's a couple other times you might hear a frog making noise. Um, for example, if uh, something grabs them, that great blue heron grabs them, or a person grabs them, they may make what's called a, a release call, like, let go of me, like, beep, you know, and then they'll, they'll try and jump away. Uh, but most of the time, it's the males that are calling, and they are looking for a female to have babies with. And there's the whole life cycle. So this is probably, this is probably a female frog, and she's the one that's gonna lay the eggs. And the male goes to the pond with her. They, they have to lay the eggs in water. And then the whole cycle continues until there's more little frogs. And then when they grow up, they do the same thing all over again. All right. So we are going to get into the different sounds that frogs actually make. What sound have you always heard that a frog makes? It's probably the same thing I learned when I was young. I even had toys that you could press buttons or pull on a knob, or it might say, what does the frog say? Or what does the cow say? Or what does the cat say? So let's see what you guys think. These are just some examples. All right, yes, we all learned that frogs ribbit, correct? Very good. But you're gonna think this is hilarious. None of those 32 species that we learned about earlier on, none of them ribbit. So none of the frogs in Georgia ribbit. Isn't that crazy? So why did we learn that? Why did someone tell us that? Well, it is because of this picture right here. Where do you think this picture came from? Because this helped spread the ribbit sound throughout the world. So was it either through the internet, movies, or the radio? Well, I guess it couldn't be radio if it was a picture. <laughs> so you're down to two options, internet or movies. Yes, you guys are correct, the movie. So you've probably never seen this movie or TV show. I think it turned into a TV show eventually, but Tarzan. It was a movie in the early 1900s, I believe. It was one of the first movies that had sound to it. And it was about a jungle man who basically went around having all kinds of adventures with animals. I think there's probably a Disney Tarzan movie now. So if you've ever seen that, then you have an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, but movies were filmed in Hollywood, which is in California. So that's not Georgia, that's far away. Um, and they have a frog there that when they needed a frog sound, they were in California. So they used whatever frog species was around there. And, and let's see, and it happened to be the Pacific tree frog. So you can see from the map here where the Pacific tree frog lives. And it is not anywhere near us. We're down here in Georgia and the Pacific tree frog is out here. This is California and Hollywood's probably somewhere in there. So they made 
um, movies with that sound. And I'm gonna play the, the sound of the, the Pacific tree frog for you. Let's see. Make sure you can hear that just a little bit louder. You guys hear that okay? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yay. All right, good. There we go, it's a little noisier now. All right, so that's that frog sound that we all learned, crazy enough, is not the one that we're ever gonna hear here. So that begs the question, well, what do our frogs in Georgia say? Let's learn. And so what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna go through the next series of slides of different frogs that you very well could have living near you, whether you're in North Georgia, Metro Atlanta, or even further south. These, the species I picked are ones that pretty much live throughout those areas. And they are ones that are calling during the warmer months. So summertime, spring and summertime. Um, and they may continue to call. The, the peak of frog calling in the summer is usually in June, so we're a little bit on the tail end of things. But you could very well still hear them now, especially when it rains. And by the way, frogs call mostly at night. Um, they're mostly nocturnal. But um, you could hear them, like I say, on a cloudy day, especially if it's getting ready to rain because they're like super excited. It's party time at that point. Um, so we're going to go into a few. And I'm going to have goofy little pictures to remind you of what they sound like. And by the way, too, there will be um, a few poll questions every so often to see if you were paying attention and if you could kind of grasp what each frog sounds like. And no worries if you don't get them right, just do your best. Um, you will have some reference sheets later that will help you remember these frogs because it might be, you know, a month from now when you actually hear one and go, oh, what's the one that sounded like this, you know? And you may not remember, but we'll have some other um, helpers for you after this presentation. So the one that I see the most around my house, and um, this is one of the ones I mentioned earlier that can kind of live anywhere, it's not picky about where it lives, is the Cope's Gray Tree Frog. And it sounds like it's belching. That's what this little guy down here in the corner is doing. He's got this smelly stuff coming out of his mouth because he's belching. It's kind of like a trilly belch. So let's hear what that sounds like. So you get the idea. So the first, first part of that tract was just one frog and then there were others that chimed in. A lot of times that's what happens. They'll start talking to each other and having a party. Um, if you happen to see a cub's gray tree frog and it's not making a sound, you can tell that it's a tree frog. First of all, it's got these little circular discs on its toes like we talked about earlier. It has a little white kind of squarish patch under its eye, each eye. And then if you happen to see the inside of its leg, it's got this bright yellow color. And there's actually a purpose for that. When it's hunched down, it's very well camouflaged usually up against uh, the bark of a tree, for example. Um, even it's, the texture of its skin is, is very you know, rough, kind of looking like a, the bark of a tree. But then if a predator's going after it, it will leap and it'll flash that yellow color in front of the predator's eyes so then the predator's looking for something that's got a yellow, you know, bright yellow blob on it. But the moment the frog lands again, it's going to hunker down and that yellow will be hidden. And then the predator won't be able to find it. So that's pretty cool um, little adaptation that it has for, for survival. All right, so we have the truly belch of the Cope's gray tree frog. I heard these just a few nights ago, when, um, right outside my window when, when it was raining really hard. All right, the next one we're gonna talk about is the Fowler's Toad. So this is a, a very warty frog. It typically has two to three little warts within each spot. That's one way to identify it. Also a lot of times has this line that goes down the middle of its back. 
And I call these parking lot or sidewalk toads. They're the ones you see hopping around, especially when it's really humid at night. You'll see them near street lamps because that's um, where the insects are flying. And then it's, it's kind of like a frog grocery store to sit, um, you know, or a, maybe a fast food restaurant to sit under there and see all these um, insects. And then they can just nab them when they come by. And the reason I have a little picture of a, a child crying is because these toads sound kind of sad to me. They sound like they're whining just a bit. Let me see if you agree. I'm going to go ahead and play that call. Oh, and you know what? You may have a totally different way of remembering some of these different sounds. I'm just going to, you know, tell you what works for me. But if it reminds you of something else, then that is totally fine. All right. So the next one we're going to talk about that's pretty common in Georgia is the northern cricket frog. And like I said, these are really small. So to find them, even when they're calling, is really hard. It's because, you know, especially when they're like in a bunch of um, grasses, tall, thick grasses around a pond or something. And, you know, you can try looking for something the size of your thumbnail in there, but it's really hard to find. And so that's one reason that biologists like to use sound for trying to see what's in an area and monitoring frog populations is because it's much more accurate um, than trying to find an individual frog. And a lot of times in the dark too, that would be really hard. So we go by the sounds. So a cricket frog is gonna sound like you're tapping marbles together. And I'm almost sure that you guys have heard this before. You maybe just didn't know that it was a frog. A lot of times they'll do this during the middle of the day, especially right before a storm. It's starting to get cloudy and stormy out and you'll hear this around lakes and ponds. Tap, 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 tap. There were a few uh, Cope's gray tree frogs in the background on that recording too. So we've learned three so far. Let's see what you guys have learned so far. If Monica, will you go ahead and put that poll up? All right, so I'm gonna play one of those three calls that we just learned. And let's see if you remember which one it is. All right, we've got some that say Cope's Gray. Oh, we're neck and neck. Cope's Gray or Fowler's? You know what? They, they kind of have similar tones, so it is a little hard to tell. But those of you who guessed Fowler's Toad, you are correct. That's the one that sounds like it's whining. It's kind of nasally. Let me play the Cope's Gray again just so you know the difference. This, the Cope's Gray is the one with the trilly belch. it's a little bit lower tone and it's a little trillier so and there again um, don't worry if you got it wrong because this is like learning a foreign language and it's one of those things you know the more you go over it and the more you hear it outside and kind of do that mental exercise the easier it gets over time so even if you just learn one frog call from this presentation really well and then just kind of build upon that as you feel ready that's totally fine uh, and if nothing else, you just had fun listening to some strange sounds this afternoon. All right, so we're gonna go on to a few more. Um, 
The bullfrog, that's kind of one that everybody's familiar with as far as the look of it. It's just a big frog. And one way you can tell a male from a female frog, at least with the true frogs, the ones with the webbed feet, is you look at their eardrum here. This is called their tympanum. And if it's, if it's bigger than their eye, then it is a male, it is a boy frog. So this one is a male. If it's the same size as their eye or smaller, this tympanum here, then it's a female. I don't know that that applies to every frog, but it definitely applies to the true frogs. So the reason I have this little hint up here of what they sound like is bullfrogs have a very deep voice compared to other frogs, even deeper than the Cope's gray that we heard. So the fowler's toad was a little bit higher and then the Cope's gray and the bullfrog's really deep. And those of you adults on the, on the presentation today, you probably know who James Earl Jones is. He's an actor with a really deep voice. And those of you kids who've seen The Lion King, he is the voice of Mufasa. And I think there's a newer Lion King out now too that's more realistic looking. Same actor, really deep voice. So um, what people say a bullfrog sounds like is jugarum, jugarum. And I don't do it really well, so I'm just gonna play it for you. That just sounds like a big old frog, doesn't it? All right, we've got a few more we're gonna go into. Oh, and by the way, this frog, I took this picture at um, the Atlanta Botanical Garden. So in the middle of Atlanta, even frogs can live in the, in the concrete jungle, as they say. This is outside the conservatory. So if you ever wanna just see frogs in Atlanta, that's a good place to go. All right, the green frog. I took this picture at Atlanta Botanical Garden too, and this was in a little pool outside the Japanese gardens there. And I have a banjo here on the picture because they sound like they're plucking a banjo. All right, let me play that for you. So, and one good thing about knowing this frog call is green frogs and bullfrogs can sometimes be hard to tell apart. Maybe if there's a younger bullfrog, it could look about the same size as a green frog, because green frogs, when they're full grown, are smaller than bullfrogs, but you don't know how old they are. And also, green frogs can come in a variety of colors. They can also be kind of a brownish or bronze color, and you can see a little bit of both going on with this particular frog. But if you hear one little banjo pluck, you know, even if he just does one little pluck, then you know you've got a green frog near you. All right, let's move on to the next one. Now the green frog is not to be confused with the green tree frog. So we can't see the little toe discs on in this particular picture, but they are a bright, beautiful green, and they have this white line kind of going down the full length of their body. This little guy was sitting on an iris leaf outside um, Charlie Elliott Wildlife Center's Visitor Center, and that's in Mansfield, which is east of Atlanta, where I used to work many years ago. And they have a little bit of a sound. Their sound sounds a little like a duck quacking, and it's a happy sound. So we have a duck here, and we have a little happy frog. So it's kind of a bouncy, melodious sort of call. Let's see if you agree. It's just a happy sound. Um, so yeah, a little bit of a duck-like quality and just sort of a bouncy sound. 
And this is actually our state amphibian. If those of you who have learned kind of like the Georgia symbols, you very well may learn about the green tree frog in school. All right, so we're gonna do another quiz. We did three more frogs. So we're gonna do another poll and I'm gonna play a call. I'm just gonna pick one of these three randomly here and see if you can identify it. All right, here we go. <laughs> Good job, guys. You all got it right. That was indeed the bullfrog. All right, so we're going to do. I think we've got just a few more. Um, and there again, these are all frog calls that you'll only hear in the warmer months. So it's not that they go somewhere when it gets cooler out, they're just not breeding then. Remember, we learned that they call to find a mate. So there's a whole other suite of frogs that we could do another presentation about that you would hear more in the cooler months. And it's kind of weird to even think that frogs would be mating when it's you know, possibly snowy outside. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, when it cools off in the fall and winter, there's a whole other group of frogs that call. So we're just doing ones in the warmer months. All right, so the squirrel tree frog doesn't look much like a squirrel, but if you've ever heard a squirrel squawking, well, they make a bunch of different sounds, but there is one sound that they make that sort of sounds like this frog. So someone thought, well, we'll call it a, a squirrel tree frog. They look a lot like um, the green tree frog, but remember we said the green tree frog had a white line all the way down its body? This one does not. And green tree frogs, when they're full grown compared to a full grown squirrel tree frog, is gonna, the squirrels are gonna be a little smaller. So let's see what a squirrel tree frog sounds like. Let me find that, hang on just a second. Hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like, I can't really do it very well. That's why we have recordings. Um, but it, it doesn't really vary from that sound at all. It just quack. All right, so let's go on to another one that could be confusing if we didn't know the call. This one could look like a Cope's gray. It also has the whitish patch under its eye. But something to note, remember we talked about with the Cope's gray, it had that yellow wash on the inner thigh. This one does not. Both of these are bird voice tree frogs. So they can be a variety of colors, and so you couldn't just go by their coloration to be able to identify them. You might be able to tell it's a tree frog if you get a close look and you see the little discs, but you would really need to hear its sound to know exactly what species it is. And it is called a bird voice tree frog because it sounds like a bird whistling. And you're like, what bird is up in that tree this late at night? You know, it almost sounds like a songbird. And this is the frog that really piqued my curiosity when I was learning about different night sounds. You know, I think I was out learning about owls of all things. And then I kept hearing this. I was like, what is that bird doing? Well, it wasn't a bird. It was a bird voice tree frog. And it sounds like it's whistling. It's got this one kind of one note that it whistles. It's a very smooth whistle. It's not raspy at all like some of the other frogs that we've gone over so far. All right, the bird voice tree frog, very pretty. And then we have one, as I think I mentioned earlier on when uh, I think Joe first came on, 
was there is a tree frog that barks and it sounds like a pack of hound dogs. And like some of the other frogs, it can vary quite a bit in color. And this one even varies in pattern. Sometimes it has spots and sometimes it looks like a, a little squirrel tree frog, but has a very, very different sound. And so let's listen to the barking tree frog. Think there was a pack of hound dogs coming out after you. All right, so that's pretty different, huh? And these are really large tree frogs too. If you happen to see an adult one, um, if it's, especially if it's got the spots, even if it's not calling, it's probably going to be a barking tree frog. And they are just, they are very fun. All right, so we got a few more and then we'll have, um, let's see. Oh, actually, let me go back one. We got to do it. We got to do one more poll on these last three that we did. Um, so, Monica, if you'll pull that poll up. All right. So, I'm going to play one of these either the barking tree frog, the bird voiced, or the squirrel. And let's see if you guys know which one I'm playing. All right, good job. That is the bird voice tree frog. Okay, we only have two more. And then these are some of my favorites, the next two, just because they're weird sounding. Now the Eastern narrow mouth toad, you think of a toad as being a large, you know, relatively large chunky creature. But this little toad is, is not the normal kind of toad. It's pretty small. If you've ever seen a muscadine grape leaf, you know it's probably about this big around. Well, this little guy is sitting on the grape leaf just to give you an idea of the size. And it has these extra folds of skin near its eyes that it will actually use to cover its eyes when it eats ants, like even fire ants. So that's a lot of its diet there. And um, it protects itself and its eyes in particular by using these little folds of skin here. And they have this little nose and they sound very nasally. That's why I have a picture of a person with a, with a clothes pin on their nose because they sound very nasally. And it's almost like a piercing nasally sound. So for an itty bitty creature about the size of your thumbnail, it has a really powerful set of lungs. So let me play that one for you. This is the Eastern narrow mouth toad. They almost sound like they're saying, cheese. That's my goofy way of remembering it too. Like someone with a nasally voice saying, cheese. Anyway, um, so that's, that's one frog that's hard to miss. It's almost like a piercing sound when you hear it. But there again, to try and find this itty bitty little thing in the dark would be very difficult. But just hearing it, knowing it's around is pretty cool. All right, I saved. I think my favorite and perhaps yours for last, um, although they're all very fun. The Eastern Spadefoot Toad, very strange kind of cryptic looking species. It's got a, a that vertical eye pupil. And um, it's, it's a little hard to tell in this picture, but its thumb is kind of like a little shovel. And it, uh, similar to the gopher tortoise, it digs burrows and it hangs out underground most of its life. So it's not one you're gonna see real often, but after a very, very heavy rain, these guys will come out to breed. Um, and I know it's a little hard to tell, well, what is this little picture here trying to make it sound like? Um, well, they sound a little like they're vomiting. And so that's kind of funny, right? So the Eastern Spadefoot Toe, let's hear what it sounds like. Uh 
That's a funny sound, isn't it? Um, I can't see your faces, but I would imagine you're laughing right now. Um, so yeah, none of our frogs ribbit. None of the ones we talked about, none of the ones we didn't talk about in Georgia ribbit. But they, they make vomiting sounds, they peep, they belch, um, they sound like marbles tapping, they do all kinds of other fun things that, to tell us that they're out there sharing space with us. Um, so, uh, let's see, I'm gonna go into the next slide. Oh, I wanted to tell you a quick story about a, a spade foot toad, the very first one that I ever saw. Um, I think I'd maybe heard them before, but I never actually saw one. So I was at a wedding, my cousin's wedding on Hilton Head Island, and it was an outdoor reception. And so they had a, a tent and a dance floor set up out there kind of near the beach. And um, it had just rained a ton. And thank goodness they had a tent or we all would have got soaked. And then um, I was just kind of hanging out on the sidelines. I wasn't big into dancing so much. And I happened to catch a frog jumping around on the ground in between everybody dancing. And there was this one woman that had these stilettos on, these high heel shoes. And this little frog was barely missing her feet as she was dancing. And I got so worried that it was going to get impaled by her heel. So I leapt in the middle of <laughs> all of the people dancing and picked it up and saved it from the woman's high heel shoes. And uh, he did not turn into a prince when I almost kissed him. But uh, he, I'm sure, was very grateful that I got him out of that danger. So that's my little um, spade foot toad story. All right, so here is the final quiz. Pretend you're sitting by a pond like this one at sunset. You still see a little bit, but it's starting to get dark. And there's all kinds of sounds going on. So I'm going to play a recording of, uh, of something you could hear. I'm not going to tell you if it, how many species or anything it is. Um, but it's going to be, you should hopefully recognize what you're hearing. It's going to be um, something that we've talked about already. All right, so let's see. Uh, well, yeah, go ahead and put the poll out. Okay, so you've got some choices. And it could be both of these, one of these, none of these. Uh, let's see what you think. <laughs> Here we go. Go by this one. Oh my goodness, that was loud, wasn't it? And it can be very, very loud. All right, that was a hard one, I admit. Um, this was something, I had to learn my frog calls to actually do some frog monitoring. And there would be stops that I would have to get out of the truck and listen. And sometimes it would be simple, I might hear one little banjo pluck and know that there was a green frog there. But other times there would be two or three or even up to you know five or six species all hollering at the same time. So that made it really tricky. And this one was kind of challenging too. The main frog that you guys heard was the Eastern narrowmouth toad. That's the one that sounds really nasally. It's going cheese. So those of you who guessed that, good job. You got that one. There was, however, some Cope's gray tree frogs that truly belch playing as, during that recording as well. So they weren't as loud. Those, um, the Eastern, the narrow mouth are just almost piercingly loud, but yeah, and it might have been a little hard even to hear over the, the internet, but 
If you guessed both of the above, then you are correct. And there again, don't take this personally if you didn't get the answer right. This is one of those things that just takes time to learn and we're just here having fun right this second. All right, so good job on all that. We've uh, got you to fall in love with frogs now, if you didn't already, with all their cool features and fun personalities and crazy sounds that they make. So how can we help them? Because we know um, that you know all wildlife could use our help at times. Well, the best way is to protect and create habitat. So maybe all you have really any control over is what's going on in your yard, or maybe by extension, your community even. So if there's a pond nearby, you could do um, water quality testing, make sure it's clean, or you could create a pond, a backyard pond, and it wouldn't have to be near as fancy as this. It could be, you know, the size of a bird bath even, and it would be fine. It would still attract some frogs. Or you could even do something as simple as leave a log down on the ground rather than clearing it away, because those retain moisture and they're great spots for frogs to hang out and stay moist and cool on a really hot summer day. So those are the main things you can do. And then if you have a pool, you can help frogs by giving them a way to hop out. I know that sounds crazy, but they need something completely flat to be able to leap off of to get out of the pool. I have a lot of friends who have pools and they get frogs stuck in their filters all the time. And so all you really need to do is give them some sort of device to be able to get out. And this device is called a frog log, oddly enough. Um, you can find it on the internet, but that's one way because they're going to get in there and the chlorine and stuff is not great for them. You know, it's chemicals. So just like if you put out other chemicals because they breathe through their skin and they stay moist all the time, they could be, you know, that could be harmful for them. So just you know, help your parents to understand and you adults on the, on the call now, um, just to minimize whatever chemicals you use around the yard if you want frogs to live there. Um, I've had people say, well, I don't have any frogs in my yard, but you know, and then I ask, well, do you have pesticide? Do you have a pest control company come out? And they're like, well, yeah. Well, guess what? The frogs eat the bugs and then they take in the, those chemicals through their skin. So they're not going to really want to live there if there's no bugs and if there's like poison in the yard. Um, and that's, you know, there's benefits to everything that people do, but you just have to kind of weigh out the pluses and minuses. And if you want frogs around, you probably don't want um, pesticides. All right, so, and then once you've learned all this stuff and you, you're armed with all this cool knowledge, you can help contribute data to larger science projects or what we call citizen science projects. Um, just like the Adopt-A-Stream Confluence is kind of the main focus is about monitoring water quality, whether it's in streams or, you know, it could even be another body of water. Um, you could certainly help with those efforts. There are some other programs you may want to look into. One is iNaturalist.org, where you basically record not just frogs, but anything else that you might find out in nature. And if you're not sure of the identification, they can help you with that. Um, there's a program in Metro Atlanta that's put on by the Amphibian Foundation called the Metro Atlanta Amphibian Monitoring Project, or MAMP, that's a little hard to say. Um, and then there's another program called Frog Watch that I think is uh, in Georgia, there's a couple different facilities that, that um, do frog monitoring. So if you've completely forgotten everything that I've said uh, <laughs> and wanna keep learning your, your frog calls or maybe both, then there's a couple different ways to do that. Now, DNR Wildlife Resources, we have kind of an older technology format for frog calls. It is a CD called Calls of the Wild. I think it costs about $14 when you add the um, shipping and tax to it, but you can order a copy if you've got a computer at home or even a CD player um, that has a CD drive, then you can put it in your iTunes yes. library. And that's how I did that. Um, that's how I learn my calls. So I would put them in my iTunes library and just put them on shuffle. So in between all the music I like, I would randomly hear, you know, or some other frog call. And I was like playing think fast with myself, just trying to go, okay, which one is that? Just like if I had walked outside and heard a frog call, um, same type of deal. And I did that often enough and I learned them. 
Um, there's a couple other resources. I'm going to click on some of these just so you can see them and it might take me a second to remember how to share my screen. Um, okay, let's see, I'm almost there. So this is the Savannah River Ecology Lab and this particular website has a list of all the frogs that live here. And what you can do is hover over the name of the frog. It'll pop up a picture. And some of them have calls that you can listen to if you click on the frog name. If it has a call loaded, then you'll see the little um, audio sound here and you can click on that. And then you'll hear that. <laughs> sounds horrible. <laughs> that's the one, that's the Eastern Spadefoot toad that sounds like it's belching. <laughs> sort of. Not belching, I'm sorry, vomiting. Getting my bodily sounds mixed up. So that is the vomiting toad. Um, so that's, that is one resource that you can go to. Let me go back to my PowerPoint. And hang on, I got to go back to the right screen. Um, there we go. All right. The other resource that's pretty good is um, this US Geologic Survey website. And hang on, oops, I'm doing all kind of fun, crazy stuff, aren't I? Let's see if I can get to that one and show you guys. Now this one doesn't have a list, but it has um, a drop down, well, I guess it does have a list. It has like a drop down box. Let me go to that and share it with you. All right, so this is um, a frog quiz website. You go to public and you can pick your state. So we would pick Georgia. Oh, I'm gonna just pick it from a drop down box. And then there's all these different frogs here that you can learn more about. Um, and we'll have these resources on your, um, on the adopt -a stream Confluence website. There's a resources and recordings page. And um, you can go to that. I'm going to go back to the screen real quick. So, um, and other than that, we've got just a few minutes left. Oh, actually, I'm right over. So if you want to stick around and ask a few questions, um, or Monica, if there were any in the chat box that you want to want to bring up. Um, but here's my contact information and feel free to reach out to me at any time. I'm happy to help. So, all right. That was awesome. Really fun. All right. Well, thank you. I hope you guys had fun tonight. And um, that went a little bit longer than I was hoping. I guess I just get super excited when I'm talking about frogs. But I hope you um, learned a lot tonight. What is my favorite frog? Well, you know, I feel like I have the most experience and fun times with the Cope's gray tree frog. So even though they're common, they're, they're actually very easy to handle. Um, now, if I do handle a frog, I make sure I've got clean hands. I don't have any bug spray or anything like that on my hands. And even if they're already a little wet, that helps because I don't want to pull the oils off of them. But um, I find them outside in my yard a lot. I'll pick them up and they'll just kind of hang out and sit with me for a minute. Um, and I just think they're really cute. Uh, but, but gosh, it's hard to say that as far as, um, prettiness of a frog. I think the barking tree frog, the one that has the bright green oftentimes with the spots is really, really pretty. That's a hard question. Um, but thank you. I appreciate you guys coming tonight and um, we will have a recording of this session up if you wanted to, to learn more again and, and as well as, you know, we'll have those resources for you to, um, to look into. I, I looked to see if there was a frog app like an app that you could download for your phone with frog calls, because I know there's similar things for birds, and I was not able to find anything, not for Georgia at least. So maybe that'll be my next project. If I can get with a technology guru to, um, to make a frog call app, that would be fun. So, all right, well, thank you guys for coming tonight.
We hope you have a great rest of the week and um, listen out for those frogs. I think we're supposed to get some rain coming through the state pretty soon. So hopefully you'll, you'll be armed with more knowledge and know what you're listening to. Right. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Monica, Thank you. and everybody else for coming. Y'all take care. All right, bye-bye.